You think Michio Kaku is our Dice K Matsuzaka? Hello there, my friends. This is Tim Benall of BenallofAmerica.com with another edition of Benall of America Audio Season 2. It is March 31st, 2007, and this week we have for you a very, very special edition of Benall of America Audio. I think I say that every week, but this week it is very special. It is the Benall of America Audio Baseball Special, and this is sort of a concept that I was tinkering with over the month of March and really sort of threw it all together here. At the end of the month this past week, I recalled that we had discussed baseball and esoterica with some of our guests in the past. I knew that many of our guests on the program are baseball fans. We only really got to a fraction of them this week. And, of course, I am a big baseball fan, and I'm excited about the beginning of baseball season this coming week. So we wanted to wrap that all together. Esoterica, baseball, and all of America audio. Put them together, see what comes out experimental esoteric radio that's what you're going to hear this week on the program and having listened to the interviews now post recording them i think it's a pretty interesting mix i think we really hit on a lot of interesting topics within esoterica somehow via using baseball as the as the springboard i'll be interested to hear what the audience thinks of this if you're not a baseball fan don't give up don't shut off the episode give it a shot You know you want to hear Stan Friedman talking about steroids. You know you want to hear Lauren Coleman imploring Major League Baseball to do something about potential suicide clusters. Those two segments are just from previous Ben All of America audio interviews. Those are the clips. We're throwing them in for fun. Then we've got three fresh interviews with former BOA audio guests. They're going to talk baseball and esoterica with us. First, Adam Go Rightly. He was on the program last December. He's back to talk about Doc Ellis and his LSD-infused no-hitter from the 1970s. And Adam's going to talk about being a Giants fan and Barry Bonds and steroids, the Dodgers and MK Ultra. He's going to talk about that. It's a really wild mix of esoterica and baseball with Adam Go Rightly, plus an update on what he's been up to. From there, Paul Kimball stops by. He's going to talk about his blog post from two years ago in the afterglow of the Red Sox championship predicting that ufology would someday have their Red Sox moment. We're going to catch up with Paul now and find out two years later what he thinks of that post, what he was trying to say, and does he still stand by that? Is there still going to be a Red Sox moment for ufology? Then we're going to find out about why Paul likes old school baseball better than new school. He practically makes me cry at one point. It's hilarious. And we're going to find out what he's been up to since he was on the program last. Wrapping it all up, we reunite with Greg Bishop, one of the very first guests on Banal of America Audio. He's back. We're going to cover a wide array of stuff. Greg's going to have a rebuttal to the Red Sox moment ufology discussion that Kimball and I had earlier. We're going to talk about the X-Files Roswell baseball episode. That segues into discussion on why there's no black people in ufology, which is really... uh, fascinating topic that has yet to come up on the program. Then we're going to find out about him being a Dodgers fan, the Dodgers-Giants rivalry, how that carries over to the Go Rightly-Bishop rivalry in hilarious ways, and he'll respond to Adam's MK Ultra Dodgers story. That sort of encompasses a lot of what's going on here with these three update interviews. It's very lighthearted. It's more like a conversation and less like an interview. For those of you who are unfamiliar with all of these guests, go to banalofamerica.com. Go to the audio archives. Each of the returning guests has done two-week shots on the program previously, so you're talking three hours of material right there with Bishop, Go Rightly, and Kimball. Lauren Coleman stopped by for an hour and 46 minutes, BOA Audio Season 1. Stan Friedman, of course, is the star of his own Christmas special here on Banal of America Audio. The Christmas specials, go back to the archives. You'll be able to find them. 
So if you're not familiar with these folks, there's a wealth of material there. I can't read all those bios. You just want to get to the episode already, I bet. We're not going to do the bios. You know who they are by going to those interviews. We already do the bios there. Check those out for more information on all these great guests. We're going to rock it out first with Stan Friedman talking about steroids in baseball from the Banal of America Audio X Conference Sessions, our first segment here on the Banal of America Audio Baseball Special. You're an old school baseball fan. That's what you told me yesterday. So what do you think of this uh, steroid flap? We'll, we'll move away from ufology and into something uh, that probably people don't get a chance to hear from you, and that's a, a sports-related question, but um, I, that's what I'm interested in hearing your opinion of. So what do you think of the, the steroid controversy in baseball? I'm frankly rather disheartened. Growing up as a kid in New Jersey where you had three major league teams within earshot, so to speak, you were either a Dodger Giant or Yankee fan. I was a Dodger fan, and I was really inspired by, for example, Jackie Robinson. The guy's guts, his daring, his challenging of pitchers, all the rest of it. It was all based on native ability and then some. He had an overabundance, if you will. And frankly, it gave me hope, as a young Jewish kid, if a black guy can put up with what he had to put up with that first couple of years and still succeed so well and be so exciting, then there's hope for the rest of us. But I grew up respecting native talent. And the chemical enhancement of capabilities bothers me, frankly. I don't much approve of that. I think that that's what makes sports exciting, is A, that you can aspire to do what your heroes do, and of course, one thing that was different then, the same guys played for a team for a long time, so you could develop loyalties, which was important, and there were human relations things that were important. They weren't get, getting paid these horribly large salaries, which I think is nuts. Uh, when a southerner, Pee Wee Reese, can play shortstop to Jackie's second base, uh, that's an inspiration, too, that people can overcome their innate prejudices and so forth. Now, if you throw chemistry into the act, that fouls up everything. And I'm sure that some people are more enhanced than others, and the beneficial effects are greater with some people than with others. But I love to watch baseball. I used to take my kids. When the Dodgers moved to California, I moved out there, too, not because of them. But you take the kids to Dodger Stadium. It didn't cost me an arm and a leg, and it was fun. It was good. And when I look at some of these guys now who don't realize they've got fans looking up to them, and young fans especially, and where it's who can make the most money and take the most pills, so to speak, at some risk to their own bodies, incidentally, which is another bad thing. Sports is tough enough as it is, you know, without throwing in the, the pain from the chemicals at a later date. I'm dismayed. I, I'm not in approval of enhancement. And uh, I, I think that baseball has let this go on for much too long. It hasn't done the disciplining that needs to be done. And, you know, we living in Canada when Ben Johnson won the 100 meters at the Olympics and then lost it. It was a horrible disappointment to an awful lot of people. And, you know, the guy worked awfully hard. He was a good runner. Uh, it's a shame he had to go that, that extra step to be the best. And so in ufology, we have people who talk much bigger than they should. It's like they've chemically enhanced their presentations. And I don't much approve of that either. So I'm fairly consistent. Uh, I like loyalty. I like talent. I like people who work their butts off to get where they are. And it's, I suppose it's a throwback. I worked my way through college. I had scholarships, but I worked as a busboy in the Catskills two summers. I waited table. I was a union waiter in Chicago for three years at a good restaurant south side of Chicago. Uh, I earned my way, in other words. And I tend to look upon that as the way things should be. Uh, yeah, it's nice if you got a rich uncle. <laughs> but, you know, Hughes Aircraft once did a study of their engineers and found the higher the percentage of their college expenses they had made themselves, 
the more they were making now, which I thought was an interesting correlation, you know. So uh, you leave the chemicals to the chemists as far as I'm concerned and take them away from the athletes. There you go, folks. That was Stanton Friedman from our very first interview here on Ben All of America Audio, the X Conference sessions at the X Conference 2 in Washington, D.C., April of 2005. Of course, you can find out more information on Stan Friedman at his website, www.stantonfriedman.com, S-T-A-N-T-O-N-F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N.com. We're going to move right into the next clip from Lauren Coleman's appearance on Ben All of America Audio Season 1, discussing suicide clusters in Major League Baseball in the late 1980s. Lauren Coleman was on top of this story way ahead of anybody else and was trying to get the word out back then. He tells us all about it in this clip from our interview last February. It's the next segment here on the Benalla America Audio Baseball Special. When I decided uh, in really in the about, it was 10 years ago, to retire from the university to uh, really look at getting away from academia, I started consulting on the side in suicide prevention and so that I could have at least some stable, even though my income literally is, you know, zeroes out because of my expenses are about there too. Yeah. Um, at least that was a way to pay the mortgage and pay the, the oil bill here in Maine. Yeah. And, uh, and then cryptozoology was on the side. But, and now it's flipped around so that I'm almost seen full-time as cryptozoologist, but I still am in the, that field of suicide prevention so that, for instance, uh, during the, I think it was the second week of January of 2006, you could pick up a Sports Illustrated and there was a huge story about uh, football suicide clusters. And I'm interviewed in that and across four or six pages, there's quotes from the copycat effect in my books on yeah. suicide. And nobody reading that would know that I'm also a cryptozoologist. So sometimes the twain doesn't meet, but I'm very open these days talking about I think there's a lot of overlap. You you have media flaps in both of them. Yeah. They affect sightings. Uh, it affects the way kids are going to react, either saying they see it, saw a Bigfoot or, unfortunately, for the more vulnerable teens and older people around us, it's, it's in terms of killing themselves. So there's a lot of understanding about interviewing, about manipulation of the media that occurs that I really have taken from both fields to uh, put in copycat effect or in, into my other work about cryptozoology. Why don't, you, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about these football suicide clusters, because I've never really heard about this before until you really just mentioned it. Well, in my book, The Copycat Effect, I do a whole chapter on baseball player suicides. Uh, in the 1980s, I, did, I was the first person to study uh, the suicides that were occurring in Major League Baseball. And I studied it so much by, that by the spring of 1989, I wrote every uh, Major League manager, uh, CEO, uh, general manager, and uh, also the commissioner of baseball and said that we need to wake up. Statistically, we're going to have some suicides uh, in this year, in 1989, and we need to get some funding. You need to really take a look at the fact that you're not doing anything to prepare some of these baseball players. As it turns out, that was the summer that Donnie Moore shot himself. Oh, wow. uh, Donnie Moore was the Angels pitcher that gave up the, the final pitch uh, that David Henderson turned into a home run and the Angels didn't go to the World Series, and the Red Sox did that year, 19, uh, 1986. But he killed himself uh, three years later after he'd gone to the minors, and I'd studied and found out that baseball players had kill, kill themselves within three years of when they retire from Major League Baseball or as an older man. Oh, wow. Uh, so that here we had Donnie Moore plus three other baseball players kill themselves that summer. So I was uh, phenomenally right in my prediction. And baseball, I think it was the next year, uh, got together the BAT program, which is uh, assistance to uh, retired baseball players to try to, you know, if somebody falls on bad times or yeah. needs some therapy, they'll get their help. There you go, folks. That was Lauren Coleman talking about suicide clusters in Major League Baseball. 
Of course, you can find out more information on Lauren Coleman at his fantastic website, Cryptomundo.com, C-R-Y-P-T-O-M-U-N-D-O.com. Up next, segment number three, the first of the fresh material, Adam Go Rightly. We got a hold of him right before he was leaving town for a little vacation and got him to tell us about the Doc Ellis LSD-infused no-hitter, the Dodgers and MK Ultra, and life as a Giants fan. Here now is segment three with Adam Go Rightly. And we've brought back former BOA audio guest Adam Go Rightly. We had him on last December, back December of 2005. It's been quite a while since we spoke to you. Welcome back to the show, of course. Hey, thanks, Tim. One of the stories I wanted to get to came up actually here when I was planning for the baseball special, and this was the story of Doc Ellis and his LSD-inspired, LSD-fueled, I guess, uh, no-hitter that he pitched back in the 1970s or so. Could you share that story with the uh, Banal of America listeners? Yes, it was on uh, June 12, 1970, that Doc Ellis, who at that time pitched for the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, he was in he was uh, kind of chilling in L.A. that day, thought he had a day off, and so decided to trip with a, a lady friend of his, and they dropped some acid around noon that day. And... Uh, Doc was just starting to come onto it when his girlfriend noticed in the newspaper that he was uh, scheduled to pitch that day. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so uh, the game was in San Diego with a uh, scheduled starting t- time around uh, 6 p.m. So Doc uh, had his girlfriend drive him to uh, L.A. International where he caught a flight to San Diego. And uh, so by the time he made it to the mound uh, that evening. He was blazing, as they say. Yeah. And the rest, as we say, whoever we are, is history. And when when did that come out, uh, that he was tripping out on acid uh, at the time? Yeah, I first heard about it, uh, I'm not sure when his autobiography, I remember hearing about it in the mid-80s. I went, wow, that's wild. Nowadays, Doc is a, a drug counselor, it so happens. <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, now I remember in your book also that you had a little section there on your own UFO LSD trip. So uh, mm-hmm. have being I haven't done uh, I haven't done LSD unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah. ha, as someone who has, does it sound like reasonable that someone could pitch a no hitter, uh, which is incredibly hard, um, mm-hmm. while on LSD? Or does that sound like something that you like? Well, you know, having done it, I actually kind of sounds pretty believable. I think it's uh, reasonable. It's uh, all about, uh, you know, you couldn't take it every time and uh, duplicate that. (laughs) Every uh, time is, uh, you know, every trip is different. But sometimes under uh, hallucinogens, you hit a a groove where everything is just falling in place perfectly. So that might have uh, been what happened to Doc if the story is on the level. I don't doubt it, uh, you know, uh, although, uh, you know, looking at the game itself, uh, his control was, wasn't the best. He beamed two batters that day and walked uh, something like eight or nine. <laughs> oh, wow. So, so, but nobody was able to hit him either. So, uh, yeah, part of it might have been just that wildness after he hit a couple guys that spooked them and, uh, that might have attributed to helping him pitch the no hitter as well. Nice, yeah. Now nice. I, what's that? <laughs> he said nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I know you're up in the, uh, in the San Francisco area. Are you, are you still a big baseball fan up there now? I remember Bishop was kind of busting, uh, busting your chops via email to me about it, so I didn't know oh. if you were still a fan, yeah. <laughs> Of course, the greatness that is the uh, San Francisco Giants. Now, what do you and think of ho- holiness, Barry Bonds? That's what I was going to ask you about. Are you, uh, what side do you want in the big Barry Bonds thing? I understand, okay. like the locals are so are more pro Barry. Mm-hmm. He's what? a great man. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking as forward to as long as he's hitting home runs. There you ho- go. Hopefully, uh, you know, I'm tired of uh, Barry. Like everybody else, he's a uh, He's a punk, and <laughs> when he starts hitting those home runs and the Giants uh, win, everything's uh, good. Hopefully, this year he'll break the uh, record. The uh, Giants will go to the World Series and win. He'll retire, and uh, they can start 
uh, on a new path. And uh, right now, the pre- uh, preseason uh, how people are rating the Giants seems to be a bit underrated. They're, I think I read the one that said uh, they're predicting them to uh, place fourth in that the Western Division there, which I uh, think uh, I, I think the Giants will have a, a good season. Their bullpen's a little questionable, but they got a lot of good young pitching, and then uh, you know, as far as offense, they've got a lot of older veterans. So if they can stay healthy, uh, it might be a good season for them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, what have you been up to uh, since we talked to you last on the program? Uh, I know you uh, you have launched a radio program of your own and and all kinds of good stuff. So, give us a little update on what you've been up to. Yeah, the radio web radio show is Untamed Dimensions, uh, which you can check out at uh, www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash go rightly. And in fact, uh, just last night on the show, I interviewed Greg Bishop about a. Uh, number of things, one of them being the Tommy Lasorda L.A. Dodgers MK Ultra Mind Control Conspiracy. Really? Yeah, of course. I'll have Greg, to ask him about that. Yeah, Greg was uh, evasive about this whole issue, so, so I think on uh, some level he's involved. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. How did this come up? Uh, did you hear about it, or is this something that he's talked about? I uncovered this, and it's talked about in... Uh, the book by Kathy O'Brien, the name that escapes me now. She's an alleged uh, MK Ultra survivor, and she claims that uh, Tommy Lasorda, as well as uh, all other people in professional sports, were involved in this MK Ultra shenanigans. This is in the mid '80s and during the period when they uh, won the uh, World Series, and basically manipulating and mind controlling the uh, players uh, and it was all tied in with gambling and rigging games and this type of thing. Oh wow. Mhm. Interesting. That's really strange. And you know, I pointed out to uh Greg wearing an LA Dodgers cap is akin to uh you know, wearing a sign around your neck that says I like MK Ultra. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like those Freemason uh, bumper bumper emblems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from Untamed Dimensions, uh, what else you got going on? Do you got a blog thing going now too, oh, yeah, don't you? Just, just uh, got the blog going. It's uh, gorightly.wordpress.com, and that's to uh, just keep folks updated what I have uh, going on, uh, you know, what upcoming episodes of Untamed, Dimen- uh, Untamed Dimensions and other appearances I'll be making on uh, – kind of hitting the uh, UFO circuit here shortly. Uh, there's a number of events coming up. One I want to publicize is Retro UFO Part 2 Yeah. in uh, Landers, California, again at the Integratron uh, this year. In fact, I just interviewed uh, some folks on Unteen Dimensions about this upcoming event. And, uh, it's basically uh, partly a, a fundraiser for the Integratron. What's the Integratron? <laughs> um, back in the uh, – that that area, Landers, California, where the Integratron and also Giant Rock is at, uh, some of the uh, very early uh, UFO sightings and uh, counters uh, occurred there, and uh, a lot of people gathered back during the day, uh, George Adamski – George Hunt Williamson, a number of folks, and in particular, uh, George Van Tassel. Mm-hmm. And um, out in the area, Giant Rock was a, a landing strip, and it became a real primitive airport at that time, uh, the Giant Rock airstrip. And this guy, Van Tassel, moved out there. Uh, he'd worked for Hughes Aircraft, but he got fed up with the rat race, moved out there, and started having communications with the Space Brothers. In time, uh, this led to uh, these, uh, what they called the uh, Giant Rock uh, Spacecraft Conventions. Uh, and, uh, you know, during the uh, heyday of this event, they'd get anywhere, I, the numbers vary, but for anywhere from five to 10,000 people. So these were huge events that went on 
through the 50s and to the mid-70s when they finally uh, ended and all the major players of, the, of that day, as I mentioned, that Damsky and all these other fellows came out there. And, uh, and so Retro UFO, the event is – oh, you asked what the Integratron was. <laughs> uh, Van Tassel received these communications uh, from the Space Brothers – uh, instructing him to build this thing called the uh, Integratron, which uh, was a type of rejuvenation machine, what it would be ultimately. And it was uh, housed uh, inside this dome-like structure that looks like kind of a, a strange-looking observatory. Mm -hmm. And inside of it would be the actual equipment. The actual equipment uh, is not there. Whether uh, he ever finished that uh, phase of the project we'll never know, but the Integratron itself still exists. And uh, as I said, part of the event is to raise funds for the upkeep of the Integratron. You can go to www.integratron.com to check it out. And also as a fundraiser for uh, the Morongo uh, Valley Historical Society. So it's a cool event. They're going to have some of the uh, old timers there, Dr. Frank Strangis and uh, Reverend Bob Short. These are famous names in the early contact yeah. scene. And I'll be there. I may be speaking. Uh, I think Greg Bishop is going to come out. He may be speaking as well. Awesome, awesome. And um, yeah, I saw you write up in Paranoia Magazine about it uh, last year, the first, yeah. the first edition. So. Uh, Awesome, awesome. Anything else going on? You said uh, you're doing – is that the other conferences too, or is that just the – Yeah, there's some other stuff uh, going on. I'm going to cover uh, the Conspiracy Con for Paranoia Magazine. That's oh, awesome. May uh, – hey, boy, sometime mid-May. Then yeah. the biggie in July, July 5th through the 8th or 9th. It's got to be Roswell. You got it uh, – so I'll be there uh, speaking at that event with Nick Redfern and Greg Bishop and uh, a lot of the other leading uh, folks, Richard uh, Dolan and a number of others will be at that event. It's it's going to be a huge uh, deal. There's there's a number of other events going on uh, concurrent, you know, just with the regular UFO speakers. Oh, I'm sure it's going to be it's going to be wild wild place down there in uh, Roswell. Yeah. I bet. And so, yeah, that's what's uh, going on with me. Awesome, awesome. Well, hey, thanks for uh, taking some time here to talk to us and all that good stuff. And hopefully some of the Middle of America audio listeners will tune into Untamed Dimensions Radio and uh, get some additional fix for esoteric radio from Adam Go Rightly. Exactly. Thanks for coming back. Thanks, Tim. There you go, folks. That was the BOA audio return of Adam Go Rightly. And, of course, you can find out more information on Adam Go Rightly at his blog, www.gorightly.wordpress.com G-O-R-I-G-H-T-L-Y dot wordpress dot com Up next, it's Internet Pundit Paul Kimball making his BOA audio return. Paul's going to be talking about ufology and the potential for a Red Sox moment. We're going to dig all into that, plus Paul's gripes with modern baseball, and of course, tons and tons more. This is quite a lengthy update from the man behind the other side of truth. So let's just roll right into it. Paul Kimball making his BOA audio return on the Banal of America Audio Baseball Special. Continuing onward here, folks, with our Banal of America Audio Baseball Special, I want to welcome back to the program Paul Kimball of the infamous blog at the other side of truth, redstarfilms.blogspot.com. Early in the season, he was on the program, and we brought him back here to talk about some of his observations with baseball and ufology, particularly this post he has at his blog called UFOs and the Red Sox Moment, something I wanted to ask him about in our original interview, but I just didn't have time in the three hours. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I knew he'd be perfect to bring back here for the UFOs and the Red Sox Moment um, discussion and discussion of uh, baseball and a little light, lighthearted talk here with Paul Kimball. So welcome back to the show, Paul. Howdy, Tim. Good to be back on Benal of America. Awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, this this UFOs and the Red Sox moment. It, I'm obviously a Red Sox fan from Boston and all that good stuff, and I really liked how you tied in uh, ufology to this Red Sox moment. And sort of it, the gist of it is that you know, uh, like Red Sox fans, if those of us in ufology will stick it out long enough, eventually we'll 
will win the proverbial World Series of ufology, which uh, I guess would be the, the, an answer to the UFO conundrum. But maybe you can flesh out what you're trying to say here with this uh, UFOs and the Red Sox moment discussion. Well, actually, you pretty much just covered it, so let's move on. Um, <laughs> no, the, the general idea, I mean, I'm a, a Red Sox fan, too. I grew up um, because I live in Nova Scotia. In the old days, NBC, was, the affiliate was out of Bangor. So we got WLBZ TV from Bangor, and, of course, they broadcast, I think it was Nissan Bread or something, whatever, you know, the Red Sox games. So instead of growing up watching the Montreal Expos or the Toronto Blue Jays, as you would think for a Canadian, I grew up watching the Boston Red Sox, as most Maritimers did here in Canada. Yeah, and that, that was basically the, the point of the uh, post, which I think I wrote um, two years ago. It was relatively soon after the Red Sox had finally, for we long Red Sox suffering fans like you and I, and pretty much everybody in New England and everybody in Atlantic Canada who grew up watching the Red Sox, <clears throat> you finally have that moment where you, you get it. There it is. You've won the World Series. And I always meant to write a follow-up to that column, which I'll get to in a second. But the idea was ufology, um, at least the ones that are looking for the extraterrestrial hypothesis to be proven to be true. And I, it, it was really directed at those folks. There are a, a, a wide group of us out here who just look at the UFO phenomenon as a mystery that probably will never be solved in our lifetime, you know, the Phil Class curse, but it might be. But we don't live and breathe UFOs, and if it's not solved, then our, you know, it, our lives are somehow unfulfilled. But there are people like Stan Friedman and uh, Dick Hall who have spent a very long time and a significant portion of their lives invested in studying and researching, and in Stan's case, lecturing about the UFO phenomenon. And writing about it, Jerry Clark's another one. There's, there's, you know, you can name them all. Yeah. There's a very large group of them. Um, and to me, they're like Red Sox fans were before the Red Sox won the World Series, <laughs> where you're, you're constantly, like every time something like the O'Hare UFO incident comes up, you see it's almost like, wow, ufology just got in the playoffs. <laughs> and yeah. you think maybe this is the year we win the World Series. This is the case that will break it. Roswell was the case. Rendlesham was the case. Kenneth Arnold was the case, whatever. And that it, it never happens. Sometimes you even get tantalizingly close, at least as far as they're concerned. So Roswell, um, you know, maybe in Stan's case, he actually thinks they won the World Series in Roswell, but I have news for him. You know, it has they didn't win. It's If, if anything, uh, they lost or maybe drew. But there's never been that defining moment for the true hardcore UFO buff, enthusiast, researcher, whatever word you want to use, proponent, where they can say, aha, it is this. We have our answer. Mm -hmm. So they're afflicted. In, in baseball, for the Red Sox fans, it was the Bambino's curse. You deal Babe Ruth and you're never going to win the World Series. In ufology, it's Phil Class's sort of famous curse. You know, I curse you that you shall never, you shall be on your deathbed and not know the answer to the UFO mystery. And it turns out Class has been pretty much right up until now. But the point of the Red Sox moment is eventually all mysteries get solved. Eventually, uh, even with long suffering Red Sox fans, you win a World Series. Things just break your way. Um, um, so that's what the Red Sox UFOs, uh, ufology in the Red Sox moment was about. My hope that there is a Red Sox moment, not so much because I need to know the answer to the UFO phenomenon. That would be nice, I guess. But, you know, it would be nice to see guys like Stan Friedman and Dick Hall before they shuffle off this mortal coil. And they're not getting any younger. Both Stan and Dick are in their 70s now. Um, guys like Jerry Clark, I think, in their, their late 50s or early 60s. Um, so they really probably only have between maybe 10 and 20 or 30 years left, which isn't a lot of time in the universal bucket of time. It'd be nice to see them maybe get some answers. If not the answer to what the UFO phenomenon is, then at least maybe something from the government, you know, Stephen Greer's disclosure kind of thing, yeah. or or something that indicates that, that they've been on the right track. Um, but the thing is, and here's the other column that I was going to write after that. Well, what happens if you win? Every Red Sox fan I know of somehow now feels less special because the Sox won. There was something to be said for this long-suffering you know, club that we all had. You could tell a Red Sox fan. You'd see them walk down the street. They'd have a cap on. You'd have a cap on. You'd have a moment, even if you didn't know them. 
Uh, you could be in Albuquerque in an airport or in, or anywhere, and you go, "Hey, you're you're a Sox fan? Yeah, you think they're going to win this year? Nah, I don't know. You know, got a good team. And <laughs> and once you win the World Series, though, you know what you are? You're just another baseball team. Yeah. I mean, I still love the Sox, but you don't have that story anymore. Now it's the Cubs um, are that team. What happens to all these ufologists? If what would they do if all of a sudden? Uh, I don't know, President Bush or somebody wandered out and said, hey, you know what? You got us. Mea culpa. <laughs> We've been lying to you for 60 years. <laughs> there, there are 50 alien races here. We've established diplomatic relations. And I'd now like to introduce you to Ambassador Nigdar of the planet Vargon um, and say a few words. Well, what do you fall to just do? All of a sudden you win and it's like, wow. And I can tell you from a Red Sox fan perspective, it was great. For about five minutes, and then it kind of sunk into me that, hey, that's something I don't have anymore, you know, that we've been suffering for 80, 85 or whatever, however many years, or in my case, all 38 at the time of my life. So I don't know. You know, there's a downside to solving a mystery. Uh, there's a downside to winning that championship, which is maybe you're not quite as special as you were anymore. And the other thing with the UFO guys is, if that ever happens, somebody comes out and says, yes, it's aliens or extra dimensionals and we've known it. Well, then everybody and their dog is going to want to get in on it, of course, you know, yeah. the entire planet. And, and then the sort of UFO click will have about 10 minutes to say, I told you so. And then nobody will care about them. They'll just be, you know, other citizens. And this, this, this idea that they'll, they'll be experts that will be consulted upon by the media and everything. No, the, the experts will go find philosophers and theologians and, and physicists and astronomers. Those are the people that they're going to be talking about, all of whom will have to say, hey, you know, maybe we were wrong, but now let's move forward. They're not going to go talk to Jerry Clark and Stan Friedman and Dick Hall or me or you. Um, so at that point, your special little club is basically down to an I told you so, and let's go find something else to do because, um, you know, our moment came and went, and it was great and glorious, but only for about five minutes. So the, the upshot of all that, Tim, is there are moments when, as a Red Sox fan, I almost wish they hadn't won the series. And if you have listeners in Boston who are listening right now, <laughs> I might I might have to be careful the next time I get off a plane at Logan, but um, or switch switch planes in Logan. But you know, it's just like a little part. I'm glad they won. Yeah. But there's a little part of me that sort of misses being able to say to my brother, who's a damn Yankees fan. You know, he'd always go, well, we got 26 World Series or whatever. And I'd go, yeah, but I got 86 Buckner. Like, how many of those World Series wins do you remember? None. They all bleed into one. I can tell you, I can remember every single painstaking loss, you know, um, in the Red Sox history, at least when I was alive. And I know other people who can remember 67 like it's yesterday. Yeah. And when you talk to Red Sox fans, I, I find most of us still talk about the losses, not the win. We still go back and talk about Bill Buckner yeah. and Bucky Dent, and not so many of us talk about beating the Cardinals in four. Now, beating the Yankees was great, but that wasn't winning the World Series. That was just kicking the Yankees' ass, and that was fun, and especially the way it happened. Now, that was great, but that wasn't the Red Sox moment of winning the World Series. When we actually won the World Series, like, oh, you beat the Cardinals in four? Yeah. I don't know. I was left underwhelmed. So I'm, I have a feeling that ufology, if their Red Sox moment ever comes – might be left underwhelmed. I don't know. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what how it how it all pans out. But you're you're confident that uh, that it will happen. I guess is the. I'm less confident now than when I wrote the thing two years ago. I was going to ask you that as a follow up because uh, you, I have it I have it on on my little laptop here, and it was uh, March seventeenth, two thousand five, right almost mm -hmm. uh, right before the beginning of the the follow up season as the defending champion, so I'm sure you were basking in the afterglow of sorts. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah. wondering if <laughs> in the two seasons since, uh, especially last year, where they didn't even make the playoffs, are your, are your thoughts on the potential for a UFO uh, Red Sox moment uh, sort of lessened at this point just, just by the nature of it all? Yeah, I was feeling, I was still feeling pretty, and I had said, you know, I was in the debate I was having at the time with the exopols, the exopoliticians and stuff, and Michael Sala, and, you know, it was a lot of what I was writing was fairly negative about the wackos in ufology. And I thought, well, I'll write something positive, um, you know, just so I'm not known as this curmudgeonly guy who <laughs> is always negative. So there were that and the Galactic Barrows boys. There were, there are some sort of cute um, positive columns from back in around March and April of 2005. 
And but trying to make a serious point, and I got to admit, two years later, you know, no, I don't think there's a Red Sox moment coming for you. Definitely for ufology, I, I think ufology is a lost cause. Um, but for people who are interested in finding the answer to the UFO mystery, which I think is uh, something different than ufology, um, I, you know, I don't see it coming. It's been a mystery for hundreds and thousands of years, not just since 1947. So, you know, is it all of a sudden going to solve itself tomorrow or are we going to solve it? I, I don't see that happening. Um, certainly not the current group of investigators and researchers that are out there. If it, if it is to be solved, Tim, and I think I've heard you say this, or, but many people say this, if it is to be answered, it will be on the terms of the phenomenon, if, assuming the phenomenon is paranormal, i.e. aliens, extra-dimensionals, time travelers. It will be on their terms, not ours, meaning they will reveal themselves to us. We will not find them. Uh, and I think that's probably true today, and it'll probably be true in 50 years or 100 years. If there are beings out there, it'll be their call, not our call, as to whether uh, they reveal themselves to us. And, and you know, if, if it's not paranormal beings or something like that, then it's more mundane stuff. Then it will happen on a case-by-case -case basis where we can explain away case-by-case, case, no, this isn't, no, this isn't, no, this isn't. Um, but that will never – you'll always have a, res, a residue of cases that remain unexplained. Even as you explain one, you'll have a new one come along that's unexplained. So the phenomenon, even if, if it was a mundane sort of thing, will continue on ad infinitum because you'll never be able to explain every case to everyone's satisfaction all at the same time. So, yeah, the only way you're going to get a Red Sox moment, um, you know, ironically – you could look at the Red Sox and say, well, did they beat the Yankees or did the Yankees collapse spectacularly? Who do you, you know, was it really a Red Sox win or was it just a colossal Yankee collapse? Yeah. A bit of both. Um, I think you're going to have to see the equivalent of a real Yankee collapse, i.e. the aliens do something, um, as opposed to us being able to figure it out. I just don't see that happening. You think Michio Kaku is our Dice K Matsuzaka? <laughs> what? Well, I don't know if he's getting eight hundred billion dollars or whatever. Um, if Kari Yastrzemski was dead, he'd be turning over in his grave somewhere. Um, you know, uh, yeah, no, I don't. I don't know about Kaku. Kaku, <laughs> Kaku seems to have. He did his thing uh, during the Peter Jennings special, which I thought was great. He did his little quote, you know, keep an open mind and everything. But he he doesn't talk about UFOs. It's not something that really seems to interest yeah. him. So uh, because it was Jennings. And ABC, I think Kaku said, look, if I appear and sound rational, I won't get tired with the UFO wingnut thing, but I will be on a much bigger stage than I might otherwise normally be on. It's good PR. It's good for business, yes. selling books and stuff. And I think that's probably why he did it. Um, but he doesn't seem to have any abiding passion in the UFO phenomenon, really. So, yeah, there it is. And to, to sort of uh, move into just general baseball talk now for the for the baseball junkies who are tuning into the episode, what do you what are your thoughts on the Red Sox for this year? Hopeful or or uh, 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 you know cautiously optimistic, perhaps? That's probably where I'd lie, I guess. Look, the, the truth is the Red Sox should be at least in the playoffs every year. So should the Yankees, with the kind of money those guys have and the budgets they have. Um, you should fire any general manager if they can't get those teams into the playoffs. Um, and probably the manager too. Now, assuming that there's not a huge raft of injuries or something like that, because there's always going to be maybe bad things happen to good people. But by and large, you know, the Red Sox and the Yankees should be in the playoffs every year. I mean, who can compete with them in the East? Baltimore? Yeah. Um, Toronto? Toronto's actually probably got a pretty good team this year, but their pitching is weak. The, the Red Sox and the Yankees have the resources to be able, if they're smart, to put a quality team out one through nine in the batting order, good reserves on the bench, a decent pitching staff, and good relievers every year. And so there's no reason why they shouldn't be continually in the playoffs, at least seven or eight years out of ten. And as it turns out, in the Yankees' case, that's what they've been doing. Um, you know, the Red Sox, uh, less so, but still they're, they're there in the hunt every year, it seems. So I think the days of, you know, the Yankees when they were just horrible in the 70s, um, or the Red Sox when they were, were losing year after year. Those days are probably gone, and they're probably gone for good, given the new economics in baseball yeah. um, and the markets that those two uh, teams are in. So, yeah, you know, I'd be cautiously optimistic about the Red Sox this year if I cared. Um, but I got to admit, I don't follow – I follow baseball in general, and I still love the Sox in theory. I wear a hat and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, my Red Sox were – Dewey Evans, Butch Hobson, Rick Burleson, Kyle Yastrzemski, Freddie Lynn, Jim Rice, those guys. 
Those are the guys when I grew up with. Those were the guys I watched play. And I still re- that's my Red Sox team. Um, I've become sort of a, an old man now, I guess. I kind of look back in the past and the lovable losers, those those great players, and the new the new guys because of the new economics of baseball. Uh, now I'm going to sound like Bob Costas. So the new <laughs> economics of baseball and the interleague play. First of all, I think interleague play has been bad because it's taken some of the sort of American League, National League rivalry out of it that you'd only see them meet in the World Series. So frankly, to me, the World Series kind of comes across as just a seven-game set between teams that have probably already played. Um, And, you know, you just don't have the team loyalty anymore. You don't find a guy like Cal – I was going to say Cal Yastrzemski or Carl Ripken. Cal Ripken Jr. or Carl Yastrzemski for the Red Sox or, for the most part, Dwight Evans, who played almost all his career before he played a season or two in Baltimore – um, these kind of guys staying with the team for their entire career, yeah. where you could develop that sense of fan loyalty. Jim Rice is another good example. Um, instead, you see guys who hired guns like Alex Rodriguez, who, f- who fire into New York for seven years or whatever on a $200 billion contract. I mean, what's the love, really? Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I can't name more than three players on the current Red Sox roster. Oh, wow. When I was a kid... Because to me, they're all interchange. Who's the icon on the Red Sox? Like who's, you know, David Ortiz. Maybe yeah. he's that one. But, he, you know, with David Ortiz, if somebody offered him a wad more cash, go somewhere else? Probably. Um, I, you know, Yastrzemski had his troubles with ownership over the years, but he always stuck around. And that's why he's always been and always will be my favorite baseball player. Cal Ripken, a close second. Alan Trammell, you know, a distant third. But those kind of guys who played their entire career with one team. I, I, you could build that loyalty, and it's just not there anymore, Tim. Yeah. As a result, I think fans in all sports, it's true in hockey, it's true in football, it's true in basketball, um, you know, the numbers might be up in terms of people watching, but the fun of it seems to be gone. It's It really does come across as more of a business now, and these guys as more businessmen than, you know, Cal Ripken or Kyle Stremsky. And maybe I'm romanticizing the past, but I don't think so. I think there was a sort of a more innocent era. And of all the sports, because baseball is so deeply rooted in the American soul and psyche, um, just the same way hockey is in Canada, uh, you know, I think that's a shame because baseball is truly a special sport. Um, football and basketball might draw more in the U.S., but baseball, they'll never have the same cachet in terms of Americana that baseball has. Yeah. And to turn baseball, and I think this was Costas's point when he would go off on his rants against interleague play and even the DH, which I don't like either. Um, you know, there's just something pristine about baseball. And you don't want to sound like an old fogey. Sure, things can change. Add more teams to the playoffs. I have no problem with that. But at some point, you know, you, should, you shouldn't be just like any other professional sports league. There should be something special about baseball. Uh, I th- I think there is, but I think they've done a pretty good job of ruining it over the last ten or fifteen years. Losing a World Series wasn't helpful. <laughs> that that was not a good that was not a good yeah. thing either. So. And what about all this uh, steroids in baseball? They didn't have all these problems when you were uh, getting into it and everything and growing up. So what are you uh, as disgusted as the, you seem like a purist? So you must be kind of annoyed by the whole thing. But wow, uh, are you sort of just like, well, this is par for the course? I saw steroids ruin wrestling and. Now it's happening to baseball or something like that. Okay, you just compared pro wrestling, which I love, but to <laughs> baseball, which is to me almost a, a religion. I'm a lapsed, <laughs> I'm a, it's like being a lapsed Catholic. I'm I'm still Catholic in name, although I'm not Catholic, but say a lapsed Protestant. But I'm I I I just don't go to church anymore, you know. But I still <laughs> love somewhere in my I still hope that the church reforms and I can go back to baseball. Um, yeah, no steroids was horrible, but who do you blame? Like, blame, here's who you blame, not necessarily in the sort. You blame the owners because they were uh, complicit in it. So to hear any owner stand up and say, we didn't know what was going on, um, you know, lies. You're lying. You knew exactly what was happening. You encouraged it. Do you blame the players? Yes. Um, certainly guys like Palmero who go before uh, Congress and lie. I mean, like that's just – and Mark McGuire should never be in the Hall of Fame. Mark McGuire should never be in the Hall of Fame, as far as I'm concerned, until he answers the question, did he use steroids? And then once he says yes, and I think we all know what the answer to that is, fine, put him in the Hall of Fame. But, you know, he he sat there and took the fifth 
and wouldn't answer questions. I think, you know, you've got you've got a duty to answer those questions. And if you don't, you sort of wander off into Pete Roseland yeah. as as this kind of figure that baseball maybe someday would like to welcome back, but you gotta come clean before you can do it. Um but at the end of the day, who do you really blame? You blame the fans. Because they were the ones who went home run crazy. You know, and the owners and the players basically were giving the fans what they wanted. And it's that quick fix mentality that we've seen in society over the last 20, 25 years, where it's it's just not enough. Baseball's meant to be a slow game. I was having a discussion with somebody the other day about what the best sport was. And uh, he was British, and he was going on about soccer. And I said, well, soccer is pretty good, um, or football, as they would call it. But yeah. like any other major sport, it has a time. You know, you got 90 minutes to play plus overtime if you're tied. But there is a structure to soccer. There's a structure to football, hockey, three periods, four quarters, whatever. Mm-hmm. Baseball, yes, they have nine innings, but there's no time limit on the innings. You literally could have a, a two-minute long inning if you got Clemens pitching in his prime, or you could have a, a half-hour long inning if you had Clemens pitching now. So, um, you know, that's the wonder of baseball is it's it's almost like a timeless game, literally in terms of how long it's been around. But each game, it's like there's snowflakes. Every game is different yeah. time-wise, the feel, the flow. And the only place I find that now is minor league baseball. I caught a game when I was out in Albuquerque with my brother a couple of years ago after we went to the Aztec. UFO Symposium, we stuck around for a while toward uh, New Mexico and then Texas, visited Nick Redfern. And we went to a game of the Albuquerque Isotopes, wonderful baseball stadium, um, sort of a triple-A team in Albuquerque. And that, that was baseball to me, sitting in the park, just hearing the hot dog vendors, seeing guys who were just, you know, not getting paid a billion bucks. Maybe they would someday, but guys going up, guys coming down, guys who know they're never going to make the show, but they play for the love of the game. All of those guys were there, and the fans were into it, and I thought, this is what baseball should be, and it's probably what baseball is never going to be again, at least at the professional, the, the, the major league level. So, you know, yeah, for your listeners who are listening, I'm a, I'm a cockeyed optimist no, that's not right. I'm a romanticist. There you go. There you go. It's like liking Lord Byron's poetry. You know, nobody now knows who Lord Byron is, basically, but it's great romantic stuff to quote women. Well, base, I'm romantic about baseball, too. Um, the way Costas is. That's why I like Bob Costas. And, you know, that kind of romanticism just doesn't exist anymore. Or yeah. at least not very much in our sort of national psyche. Yeah. Um you know, now you, listen, you're about to cry. I can just hear in your voice. Yeah, yeah, well, dude, well, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, it is heavy. Um, you know, okay. Well, I'll ask you. You, who do you think is going to win the series this year? Who would you predict? You know, it's hard. Uh, I really, obviously, I would want the Red Sox to win. So you have to, you know, kind of uh, ideally them. But if not the Red Sox, <laughs> I guess that would be. You start the answer with if not the Red Sox. Um, I could see maybe the Cubs seem kind of like they have something going on. They seem a little rejuvenated with Lou Pinella and mm-hmm. some of these new guys they got. And uh, it sounds like there's an attitude change there that might really help them out a lot. Oh, they kind of are starting to remind me a little bit of uh, Detroit was last year. Um, Detroit looks like if they might, if they could get their, their stuff together here. Uh, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see it come out of the American League Central. Um, the yeah. White Sox are always sort of uh, – troublesome and and cleveland sounds like they're trying to get their act together and yeah don't don't count out the twins either yeah Uh, i forgot about the twins it's a strong division all the way through except maybe kansas city but you know kansas city has a slew of good young players so yeah so they seem like the kind of team that could all of a sudden you'll be like where the hell like last year's detroit team just came out of nowhere so yeah i think the american league central seems really strong yeah i forgot all about the twins but definitely them um, so, you know, and then of course you got the Red Sox and the Yankees. So it's, it's a, it's a really a crapshoot. It's interesting. I find it hard to really predict. So, cause the season is so long yeah, that it's hard to even, uh, to know, but I, no one really in the national league impresses me too much other than, um, other than the Cubs really. Um, I don't know the Cardinals don't, they seem like they're, uh, the same team as last year, but that team didn't impress me much anyway. Yeah, no, they backdoored their way in, but once yeah. they once they get in, they played well. Yeah. Um, I got you know. Here's my last baseball comment. Then I'll go on the record. This okay. is my um, Sean David Morton Sylvia Brown moment here. Oh no. Um, the miners are are alive. 
No, wait. No, they're not. They're dead. Yeah, right. That was, my, that was my favorite coast-to-coast moment from last year. You <laughs> watch somebody's career go down in flames um, in, in sort of a 20-minute period of time. Um, I, I think the Tigers are going to the World Series, uh, and I think they're going to win. I think this is their year. That Their pitching is so – I watched them pitch last year, like when the, when I'd sit down and watch them. Yeah. They're so young. Their arms are so strong. They're like the Cubs without all the injuries. Yeah. You know, because you got Pryor and, and Wood, and those guys have, have problems. But you don't see that on the Tigers. They're not burned out. They've been used well. Leland um, knows how to use a pitching staff. So, yeah, I, I'm going with the Tigers, and they're going to mop the floor with whoever the National League <laughs> – sends their way because there isn't much going on in the NL, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so, well, well, there you we'll, go. we'll keep that in mind and, and have to uh, call you on it when the World Series comes around. <laughs> either, either them or the Florida Marlins. I, you know, maybe it's that – is it five years yet? Don't the Marlins win a World Series every five years? It could and then, be. It could, and then yeah. implode. So yeah. um, they get a good team too, a good young team. So, But the Tigers, I'm, I'm picking the Tigers. All right. Yeah. Um, so what have you been up to since we talked to you in September, since we had you on the show for the uh, for the big ep- double episode and everything? Everyone was raving about it at the time, so I'm sure people will be excited to hear what you've been up to since. I know you got a big the uh, UFO big evidence case there is uh, specials coming up, so let's talk about that and, and what else is coming up for you, uh, all your various side projects and stuff. Sure. Um, best evidence, top 10 UFO documentaries, I've been saying this for a year, is almost done. But we are literally in the studio later tonight um, with Chris McBride and uh, our recording guys doing voiceover work. The the uh, picture lock is almost done. So the film is set for broadcast in Canada on May 10th, 2007 on Space, the Imagination Station. It will then air on television New Zealand because uh, we've already sold it there. And our distributor is B7 Media um, in the United Kingdom, and you can go to www. Dot B as in Buffalo, 7 as in the number, media.com, b7media.com. Those are our distributors. Um, nice little thing. They actually own the rights to the Blake 7 franchise, the sort of classic science fiction series. So they're trying to do a Battlestar Galactica kind of thing where you resurrect the series um, oh, wow. 20 or 30 years later. So, yeah, they're great guys to work with. They've been very proactive. I'm, I'm pretty confident this is going to be the film that really breaks it for my company in that it will sell in a lot of different countries. Yeah. And then the hope would be that if it sells and does well, people will go back and look at the back catalog and start acquiring Stanton T. Friedman is Real, for instance. Yes. Um, and get that on television in different countries. Because when you're making films, it's very hard. You know, you move to the next one. And distribution, unless you're a company big enough to have an, your own distribution wing, usually gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. But um, we're finally starting to get distribution in different ways for different projects. So B7's looking after Best Evidence. Tim Crawford's UFO TV as Do You Believe in Magic. They're selling that on DVD, a two-box set um, with lots of goodies and extras. Uh, and he's also picked up Fields of Fear, which we did last year about Canadian cattle mute investigator Fern Belzil. So that should be hitting the DVD market sometime in the next two or three months once I get a chance to put the extras in, and uh, it'll be a two-DVD package as well with Crawford's UFO TV. Um, what else? Then after Best Evidence, I go off, I do a, a documentary on classical music for Bravo here in Canada. And then after that, sometime around June, I will begin writing and directing, although not producing, it's not my company that's doing it, a television series on the paranormal and that's all i can say about it right now for a major network awesome awesome yeah. sounds exciting now uh you say that's the hard date it's going to air in canada on may 10th yep now what about people in america are they uh shit out of luck or can they <laughs> is you're screwed gonna be, you uh, american bastards no. in the dark is there no, going to be any dvd <laughs> distribution on this or is yes. they going to have to wait for it to get picked up by like an american station or something well, hopefully it'll get picked up by an American station. If you're in the border states, you can probably see the uh, Space Channel. Uh, probably beams in via cable or something. But we we will be striking a DVD deal with a sub distributor. Um, I leave that to B7 to negotiate. It's like talking to Data or something on Star War or Star Trek. You know, B7 or B4, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I'll leave that to our distributor to uh, negotiate. And then yeah, they will be out on DVD um, before. Uh, I would say September of 2007. So before the fall, we'll have it out on DVD. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so definitely be out there. And it's uh, it's shaping up, I think, as a kick-ass film. You know, there's uh, Dick Hall, who is almost never in UFO films, Stan Friedman, uh, Nick Pope, 
Brad you, Sparks, Bruce McAbee, you know, the who's who of ufology is in this film. And you have not revealed the actual top ten yet, correct? Or uh, the, this, the order? Or so, no, or definitely not the order. And I've revealed, if people have read my blog, listened to radio interviews I've done, or met me in a bar, um, at some point or another, I've revealed all ten cases. But it would be like trying to figure out where the Simpsons live. Yeah. You'd have to go through every episode of the Simpsons and figure out the 49 states that they've mentioned they don't live in. Uh, so it would take a graduate level project for four students at MIT or something to figure out what the top ten were. But yeah, you know, it's it's no doubt I've made no bones about it. The RB forty seven case is on the list. McMinnville is on the list. Rendlesham is on the list. And then some. So those are fairly well known cases. And then there are Shag Harbor. I just finished doing Shag Harbor today. Uh, and then there are some cases that most people, even within ufology, either have never heard of or aren't terribly familiar with. And it's going to be nice to see those cases get the attention, even in four or five, six minute segments, that they really do. And hopefully it will sort of send people out and go, hey, let's go look into these things, uh, these cases a little more closely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we'll have to, uh, maybe we can do like a special episode or something to coincide with the with the Canadian premiere so we can hook up the American audience with a little insight into what the special is all about. That Now, see, Tim, that is why Tim Benal is at the cutting edge of uh, the multimedia empire that has been all of America and the <laughs> media and everything. See, absolutely. You can, in fact, you could call me and interview me from my home because I always like to watch my films on television. They always look different on TV, sound compression and stuff like that. Uh, we used to say in the music industry, if you'd recorded an album, the thing you'd want to do, and this was the 90s, you'd put it on cassette and then go listen to it, listen to it in your car stereo. Because if it sounded good in the car stereo, it, sound, it would sound good anywhere. Yeah. And so the same thing, I usually watch it on a crappy TV. So if you call me while I'm watching it, <laughs> you'll, you'll hear something along the lines of, oh, for the oh, son of a gun, like that, how, who's mixing this crap up there? Or something <laughs> like that. They cut it. They cut case number four. Oh, uh, no. Whatever. No, they won't do stuff like that. But <laughs> I usually wind up yelling at the TV. So maybe you should, maybe, that'd be great. I'd love to do it. And, and go down all 10 cases. Uh, for your American listeners in particular, um, and maybe sort of talk about this, and I can send you clips, send you audio Definitely, clips yeah. from uh, some of the interviews that we're using in the film, and find out the process by which you determine this top ten. We'll yeah, that was that was pretty that was kind of fun too. Yeah, actually. so we'll talk about that, and yeah, we'll do a special episode in May about it, and uh, maybe yeah, we'll work it out off the air here, and, and uh, we'll, we'll roll it out for the BOA audio listeners down the line in about six weeks or so. Love the BOA audience. Nice, nice. All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us here for the baseball special. I appreciate it a ton, and uh, hopefully the uh, the UFO fans got a nice fix here on UFO discussion, and then also the baseball fans got some interesting baseball discussion. A little lighthearted episode, but uh, definitely worth uh, trying out, a little experimental thing here. No, it's great. Uh, and I, I would only say that people think I don't agree with Stan Friedman on anything. We both agree on our love for baseball. Uh, although Stan's a Dodgers fan, so you know there's no accounting for taste, but um, at least he likes baseball, so that's a good thing. There you go. Yeah. All right, and uh, of course the the blog is redstarfilms.blogspot.com. That's where you can get your Paul Kimball fix. All you Kimball heads out there, check <laughs> it out. And uh, that's it. Hey, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. There you go. That was Paul Kimball making his BOA audio return. You can find out more information on Paul Kimball at his blog redstarfilms.blogspot.com. R-E-D-S-T-A-R-F-I-L-M-S dot blogspot dot com. Up next, wrapping up the whole big baseball special, we bring back a guest from our BOA Audio early days. Greg Bishop makes his long-awaited return to the program. He'll have a rebuttal for Kimball and the Red Sox ufology moment. He'll have a rebuttal for Go Rightly and the Dodgers MK Ultra story. Plus, we'll talk about baseball in general ufology in general, and an update on what Greg's been up to since he appeared on BOA Audio back in the day. Here now is Greg Bishop in the final segment of the BOA Audio Baseball Special. Ladies and gentlemen, we're continuing onward here with the Baseball Special, and our guest now is a former BOA Audio guest. He was uh, on the on the show really right at the very beginning of, of an All-America Audio, and I'll always appreciate him for that. And uh, maybe I should put him over here on this one instead of uh, when I'm on his show this weekend, because <laughs> Not to make him uncomfortable, but uh, he's Greg Bishop. He's the author of Project Beta. He's behind, he's uh, one of the members of the great blog UFO Mystic, 
and uh, he's here to talk about baseball with us, and uh, he's a big Dodgers fan, so we're going to discuss baseball and esoterica and how they tie in a little bit. And uh, welcome back to the show, Greg. Thanks, Tim. Uh, you had me on at the very beginning, huh? because uh, I was the only one that said yes there. Now anybody will come on your show. It's That's almost a close approximation to how it worked. I think. <laughs> well, at, at uh, to, Glad I could help. To pull the curtain back a little bit, what happened is that I had written something about you on the website and then about your appearance on Coast to Coast. Oh, that's right. And, and I answered and I said, oh, somebody listened and they actually cared. Yeah, and then I said, well, you know, we're starting up a show of our own. You should come on. And then you were like, sure. And next thing you know, you were like our fifth guest ever. So I appreciate that. And you know, Who was the first one? Jim Mars. Oh, okay. He's a cool guy. I got to watch him sing... Um, Oh, what was it? We went to the karaoke bar at Laughlin, and he sang um, Great Balls of Fire. <laughs> oh, wow, nice. You'll never guess the, the thing I picked. I'd never sang karaoke before, but I did that night. I can't even imagine. What what would you have picked? My Way or something? No, Ziggy Stardust. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was singing Elvis and, you know, and, and uh, Tim McGraw and stuff. And I was like, screw it. I'm going to sing I'm going to sing Bowie. There you go, you know, do something that's not overdone at the, uh, exactly. at the karaoke hall. Uh-huh. Uh, now, uh, as I was saying before we started here, we, we had Greg Bishop on. I mean, no, we, you were Greg Bishop. We had we had uh, Paul Kimball on earlier. I talked to him, and uh, he was giving me his point of view on the ufology Red Sox moment. And then when you and I were talking about doing this, uh, you had taken a different stance on that. So maybe we should do like a counterpoint on the Red Sox ufology discussion to, to, to kick off the baseball talk. Yeah, well, Paul wrote a piece, um, which you just reminded me of, about uh, the u ufology and the Red Sox moment. And basically it was uh, fans of the Red Sox waited, and they got rid of the uh, Bambino curse from throwing the piano in the lake or whatever it was. And um, he said that if, if, if uh, ufology works hard enough and waits long enough or whatever, they'll have that defining, crowning moment when everything's wonderful and everybody that's been struggling along for so long gets uh, their just reward or whatever. And uh, uh, I was inclined to disagree with that because um, the main reason is because people have to change the way they think about things and the, our model of the world before that answer comes to us, I, I think. And so you think uh, just, just that... Like uh, like we were saying, since things don't just start over for a ufology, that that all the baggage and everything is still going to be there. It's not like it's not like if your pitch is awful one year, he may have a turnaround year the next year. It's not like that. A, a bad researcher isn't just going to stop I, doing shitty things. Yeah, exactly. It, it, the, what I said a little earlier was that uh, it's like you know you, somebody doesn't erase the blackboard and start clean every spring. The blackboard still has you know dust on it, things written on it before, uh, kids writing fart on there and all that, and it's, it's going to stay there forever. And uh, uh, the way it's going, that blackboard's going to be full of junk with nothing to show for it, as far as I can see, until, like I said, the, there's some kind of big change in consciousness or the way science is, 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 uh, is, is, is done and performed before we can get our minds and our uh, philosophies and, and a handle on what the UFO thing is, because as soon as you say it's one thing, you know, there's about 5,000, but, you know, but what about this? Yeah. You know, and if everybody thinks it's like, well, we'll find out that it's aliens coming from another planet and that uh, they've been here for a while and the government knows about it, and, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, to come to some, I, I think the defining moment, um, there'll be a lot of defining moments, and some of them have already happened. You know, like when, like uh, when uh, John Keel and, and Jacques Vallée started saying, "Hey, wait a second, You know, the, 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 there's no evidence really that these things come from other planets and are piloted by extraterrestrials." Really? Yeah. Let's look at that. And those, those those books and those those ideas were defining moments, and so nobody really chose to pay too much attention to it, and they still don't, which kind of it kind of perplexes me. I think more people are paying attention to, to it than than they did because uh, people born after like 1960, 70, 80, or whatever are, are more open to those ideas. I, I I think, and that's a good thing. Yeah, there seems to be a sea change going on as far as uh, researchers uh, being open to like all different areas of research. 
Yeah, they're they're in a minority right now, but they're they're actually they, they've actually got a voice now. And then you know, media is changing so rapidly. Um, like you said uh, a few weeks ago when I talked to you, and like Paul said when I talked to him on Sunday, um, uh, the, the people that are that espouse the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, a lot of them very very knowledgeable, really smart. But they don't want to get on the internet and go on podcasts and do blogs and all that, and I, I I don't understand that. Well, well, I guess I do because people get old and set in their ways, and they say, "Oh, a bunch of stupid computer crap. I don't want to worry about it." But they're getting left in the dirt because of this, and nobody's going to listen to them. Yeah, yeah, which is unfortunate. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. It'll be interesting to see where you follow me goes as this uh, generational shift sort of uh, changes over time. What happens with with this extraterrestrial thing? Yeah. So, like I said, there's the, the the instead of having a you know a big celebration. Oh, it's finally over. Everybody knows, like like the Red Sox or you know, God. Well, the Cubs almost did it a couple of years ago, but then they the what's uh, Dusty Baker got him out of it. Now, who was who was the uh, when when they got to the playoffs? Who was the manager then? Was it uh, who was the manager before Baker? I don't know. All I remember is that guy Bartman who caught the ball and. Oh yeah, well, that, <laughs> it was like to run him out of town. Yeah, well that's that's a defining Cubs moment. Yeah, <laughs> and just in the way the Cubs always are, which is <laughs> let's let's um, do something exactly the wrong way and screw ourselves up. I've, I've got a friend that's a Cubs fan, so I'm using his words, not mine. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of a good analogy in ufology for uh, some idiot catching the ball and screwing everything up. I. I don't know. I guess it would be you know people like uh, Sean Morton or or, or uh, who's that guy Jonathan Reed, the guy with the uh, with the um, the, the captured the alien and killed yeah. it and took a bunch of pictures and people found out that he was just a big liar and had been doing it all his life. Yeah. So as we get as things seem to be going well and you know they're making it to the playoffs of ufology, if you will, we use this analogy actually, and in, in when I was talking to Kimball too. Um, then there's the you know the Sean David Mordens are the, are the Bartmans of of this situation who you know yeah just caused the complete turnaround of the game by by interfering if you will yeah and and Paul seems to be kind of upset about people that make ufology look bad but the thing is ufology itself makes itself look bad because it's you know there's no there's no direction in it. They keep hammering at the same thing. I mean, they keep banging their head on the wall, not realizing if they stop banging their head on the wall, it won't hurt anymore um, with this extraterrestrial hypothesis because it's gotten us nowhere. So, I, you know, <laughs> that's another thing that I, I talked about with Paul. He was talking about atheists and agnostics and, and, and believers, like uh, religious fanatics and I, the idea, I mean, he was saying, well, they're, you know, they're arguing that there is a God, and the other side arguing that there isn't a God. And um, I, and after he finished his spiel, I said, well, maybe they're arguing uh, arguing around the wrong premise. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's what ufology is doing, has been doing for 50 or 60 years, especially in the last few years, since, at least since 19, the mid-60s and early 70s, when other ideas were put out there. And, they, you know, they continue to argue around the same. It's aliens from another planet. No, there's no such thing. They can't get here on the other side. It's like um, <laughs> round and round and round and round, and it's, it's, it's never going to end. Now, why do you think the uh, – just to stick with the UFO discussion here for a minute before, we, before I ask you about the uh, another baseball thing, but why do you think the – you said uh, in, in the late 60s or whatever, early 70s, um, things were okay till then. Why do you think uh, all of a sudden it just became ETH all or nothing, for lack of a better expression? You know, why do you think uh, everybody sort of threw all their eggs into the ETH basket back then and, and still do now? Well, I think it's because it seemed like the most logical thing. Yeah. It still seems like a very logical argument, um, and it is. But what, I was, what I'm saying is it's not the only argument. It's not the only way to look at it. There's so many other ways to look at it, you know, you know interdimensional things or time travelers or um, – Crypto terrestrials. Uh, ex- huh? Crypto terrestrials. Yeah, I can't wait for Mac Tony's book to come out, um, which is – it's basically another evolutionary step past um, – from what I can tell, past uh, uh, stuff that John Keel wrote in the 60s and 70s. Yeah. Yeah, but all these ideas, that they, they, they're – I think people are comfortable with that idea – 
And a lot of people into, or who are into UFOs, I think, have this, uh, this us and them kind of thing where, you know, we know this is going on and you don't. And, you know, when you find out someday, you'll know we're right. So there's, a, there's some ego in there, too. But um, the, U, the UFO subject does, is not, uh, doesn't care about people's egos. Exactly. It doesn't, doesn't care about their argument. It continues on its merry way doing a myriad of things that are, are you know, 90% of them are ignored. And then uh, one of the things here I want to ask you about with this old article you wrote, BT Play Ball, I think. Is that the title of it? Let me see here. I have it. Yeah. yeah. About uh, the X-Files episode that tied Roswell in with baseball. Yeah. Um, just talk a little bit about that. And then uh, I had actually sort of segued really well into a question that I've been raring to ask a guest for a while. So and it, it's perfect for this. So um, okay. tell me uh, about that article first. Okay, it was a while back. I just looked at it again, and I, I thought, did I write that? God, that's so bad. But um, the idea I like, uh, the idea was let's um, put two subjects together, baseball and, and UFOs, and see what I come up with. Um, just, you know, Robert Anton Wilson idea, take two things that don't seem very very well connected and, and uh, discuss them in relationship to each other. And the first thing I thought of, well, there was a team, a baseball team, a minor league team in Roswell in the 1940s and 50s. I think it was the Longhorn League. Um, and uh, the name of the team was the Roswell Rockets, which is fun enough. And it's basically because uh, Robert Goddard had done his uh, early rocket research in Roswell in the 1930s. Um, so the baseball team was called the Rockets. There was a, a guy on the baseball team named Joe Bauman, which, who I think is – since passed away, but he had the home run record like until Mark McGuire broke it. But it was, oh, wow. it was it was the home run record for all of baseball. I think he hit seventy two or something, and or seventy one home runs in a season. And it wasn't official because it was a minor league; it wasn't a major league record. But it, it was the record of, in every league, unless there was one in the Negro leagues, which we don't know about because of the record keeping wasn't so good. Anyway. Um, I think that uh, David Duchovny, who wrote and I think wrote and certainly directed that, uh, I think it was called the I think it was called the Unnatural, you know, a play on the natural. Yeah. Um, it was about uh, an alien that crashed to uh, crashed in a ship and survived, and for some reason became so fascinated with baseball that he shape shifted himself into a Negro League player so he could play baseball. In, uh, in in a, in some fictional southwestern town, those are the little the issues that came up when I was thinking about. It. It's like, you know, who would think that Roswell, the Roswell incident, and baseball had any kind of uh, connection? And yeah, it's tenuous at best, but it gets you thinking on a, on a few different levels. And I like doing that. I, I do that on the blog too. I'll, I'll put things up there just to you know, people say this is crap and this isn't very important. I said, yeah, but it's fun to think about, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, it it leads you into areas that you wouldn't normally think about, and there might be some, you know, there might be some uh, some gold there. Exactly, kind of like this baseball special we're doing here on but All America Audio. Yeah, I don't know if we hit any of the gold yet. That's for you and the audience today. <laughs> um, the the question that I wanted to ask you, uh, and noteworthy here, because it, this does sort of deal with that segregation of baseball. And mm -hmm. um, one thing that somebody asked me, I was at the I was at the uh, Crash Retrieval Conference in Vegas, and. Uh, I met someone who was a reporter or journalist, researcher or whatever, for a Canadian TV series, and she didn't know anything about UFOs mm -hmm. and the UFO scene. And she asked one of the most interesting questions I'd heard that I had not had never really put together myself. And she was like, um, where are all the black people? Yeah. And uh, so that's something that I have wanted to ask uh, some guests and I haven't really – uh, gotten around to it yet, but it's definitely one of those issues that I wanted to discuss. And where do you think all? Why do you think there's no, uh, at the very least, uh, prominent black people in ufology? Or you know, even I, I've never even really seen any black people at the conventions that I've been to. I mean, now uh, I wasn't looking in the last, uh, the first two I went to. But after this girl said that, I looked, and she was right. So, um, what, what do you? What, what's going on with that? What do you think that's all about? Um, I don't really know, except for the fact that. The way people talk about things in ufology is kind of in a detached way. And most of the black people I know, friends of mine, they don't like to talk about things in a detached, analytical way. They like to talk about things in a very down-to-earth, well, how the hell does this affect me and what difference does it make kind of way. Yeah. 
as far as, I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm being racist or trying to put a bunch yeah. of people in a category, but that's my impression. And um, the other thing is there's, uh, I, I don't really, you know, find it in ufology now, but in kind of the fringes of ufology, the craziest people, a lot of them are kind of racist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but, you know, sometimes I get surprised. I'll be at a convention and people start talking. It's like, where the hell did this come from? What does this have to do with ufology? Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Talking about, you know, international bankers, and you know what that means. Yeah. Yeah, so, I've heard that a few times, too, yeah. Uh, that might be another thing. It's like, why would I want to go to a convention with a bunch of uptight, um, possibly racist um, wackos? Exactly, yeah. There's one guy, his name is something Bert or Bert something. I can't remember his name. He's who's uh, with MUFON uh, Orange County. Um, I think he wrote a book called uh, Ufology 101. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember his name for the life of me, but yeah, that's that's the only person I can think of that's a black guy in ufology. The other thing was um, in Project Beta, um, uh, there was a, a a scientist working at uh, Sandia Labs um, at the time that all that stuff was going on, the late seventies and early eighties. His name was uh, Henry Monteith. Mm -hmm. He is a black guy. He grew up. I think he grew up in the South. Um, but he became a physicist, and he got hired to work on these government projects. And uh, one of the other scientists told me it was – he'd walk into this room, and, you know, he'd give his lecture, but he'd do it in this, like, you know, this southern black accent kind of thing. And people were – he said people were kind of surprised, like, what the hell is he doing here? You know, how, how did he get in, how, how did he get to this point? You know, obviously, a guy's intelligent. It was just kind of – it was kind of this cognitive dissonance to them who the kind of people had grown up, I guess, in kind of a sheltered environment that this guy would be there, but, you know, he was there doing the research and, and doing, you know, holding up his end on his research. But the funny thing was he got very interested in the UFO subject and tried to look at it from the information he had available to him working at Kirtland Air Force Base. And um, the funny thing was later he, um, I saw a video of him on this, in this video called uh, High Strange New Mexico, and he started talking about his, how him and his wife had been abducted by aliens and that she had been impregnated and had a hybrid kid. And I was like, what? Yeah, wow, <laughs> that's weird. What's this guy doing? And then, you know, I thought he had died. And then I found, <laughs> find out that his, his, his um, first wife, I, uh, she, she was black and from the South, too. She had died. And he married this, like, uh, this, this white woman, and now they're doing a – they've done some sort of, like, New Age book about aliens and how they're here to save us. And very, very strange. And was this the wife that was abducted with him? No, no, this is a different woman. Oh, okay. I thought they were trying to do, like, a, like a Betty and Barney Hill for the, for the new millennium or something. No, well, maybe, but I don't think he's – unless uh, – I haven't seen his book. I guess I'd like to get it because it's basically like a contact e-book. But the guy was a, a scientist at Sandia Labs in the 1970s working on highly classified projects, 70s and 80s, and now, now, he, says, now he says aliens are coming here to save us. Weird. Uh, but, yeah, that was Henry Monteith, and, and he's the only other um, person in the UFO field that's black that I even knew. I mean, he's not even really in the field. He's kind of a – you know, way off to the side, kind of uh, very unknown person. But he, at, at, at the time, he was really interested in the UFO subject, and uh, Bill Moore talked to him quite a bit. He had dinner at his house. He had thousands of books and hundreds on UFOs. Huh. He said he, he had he went into his, into his little his library, which filled up a couple of rooms, and there were all these books on UFOs and physics and mathematics, and they're all they're all in plastic bags. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. Wow, what a strange story. Yeah. But I you know, it's it's just I don't know. I don't think it's I don't think it's something that that uh, the black community has not really the Hispanic community in this country or any other really any other ethnicity besides white people are interested in and that, that you know, you asked that question in the first place and I attempted an answer, but I don't really know why yeah. those people aren't interested. It, it's a strange thing. It might be a good subject for a, for a doctoral dissertation or something. Yeah, it's more of a sociology-based question, I think, than anything. To have, it has nothing really to do with what's in the sky. Yeah. Um, oh, you know what? One time I was interviewing Richard Boylan for the Mac for Excluded Middle. Uh, you know, regardless of what you think of him, I I did give him a hard time because he he was kind of being arrogant with me. At least I thought he was. Um. 
bit arrogant, and I mean that. I'd say, how do you know this, and how, do, you know, how can you be sure? And his, his answer was, I'm a doctor, and I know more than you. Oh, geez. But I, one question I asked him was, um, how come we don't hear about abductions in, you know, in poor communities, in the black community, and in, you know, in, in, in housing projects and all this other stuff? And, you know, yeah. why don't we hear about this kind of stuff? He goes, uh, because people in those communities don't really want to talk about it. They, they figure they have it bad enough without having to come out and tell people they're, getting, they're being abducted by aliens. He goes, but it does happen in those communities. I know that for a fact. So Yeah. Um, now, to jump back into uh, the, the baseball discussion here, I'm sure the UFO people are going to be like, oh, man, what, what the hell is this guy doing? But uh, we'll, okay. uh, we'll jump into the baseball stuff. And, and uh, you're you're a big Dodger fan. We had Go Rightly on, and he was uh, talking about you being the big Dodger fan. So, uh, I don't know, talk about your, your fandom here of the Dodgers. And uh, are you still uh, still following them as much as you as you were when the last time we had you on? Because I remember last time we had you on, you, were, you had to go, to go to the game. So. Yeah, well, I had season tickets, and then I got uh, laid off of my job, and I couldn't afford them anymore. So I'm still following them, but I only, you know, I only bought like 20 games this season. But last season, I went to about, I don't know, probably 20 or 30 games. Oh wow! I sold the rest of them. I even went. I, I was there the night of the four homers. Oh, cool! And I don't think I'm ever going to see anything like that ever. And that's the last baseball game I went to on my season ticket. So I was, you know, I was kind of bittersweet. Yeah. They were down three runs, I think. Trevor Hoffman was pitching. The closer for San Diego, one of the best closers in the history of baseball. And on, on like something like three pitches, two home runs go out of the park. So they catch up, and people are going nuts. And then the, the Padres come at the next inning. They get a run in, and I'm thinking, okay, that's it. This could have been so perfect. And then in the bottom of the ninth, um, I can't remember who it was for Cal or some, but Rafael for Cal gets on base, and then – uh, uh, Garcia Parr comes up and hits a home run, and they win it. Most amazing game I've ever seen. Uh, apart from uh, watching Ho- Jose Lima hit a, pitch a no hitter in the in the uh, in the uh, playoffs a couple of years ago with the Dodgers and the um, uh, I think it was the Cardinals, but it was the only game they won. So they just they, they dropped out of the playoffs right away, which is, seems to be par for the course in the last few years. Are you uh, are you looking forward to the season for the Dodgers, or do you think they've improved much, or do they not have improved enough, or or what do you think? I know they lost J.D. Drew here to uh, to Boston. Yeah, they did. I I I think they have improved, and they they've improved in the most important place, which is in the pitching. Yeah. Um, they still have Penny, and he's going to be good. Um, I think he's going to be as good or better, even though he he kind of tanked after the All Star break. I don't know why he went to the All Star break. You know, he was throwing hundred mile an hour fastballs in the first inning. Oh wow! He, he mowed him down. I think it was a one two three inning, and then the second inning he did the same thing. And then they let them. I can't remember who the next National League pitcher was, but he, the, Penny just mowed people down. I don't know where he pulled that hundred mile hour. Just one after the other, hundred, hundred and one, hundred and two, ninety nine. I was like, whoa. Wow. What's he doing? But he he knew he was only going to be in for an inning or two, so he was just giving it everything. Yeah. And now, you know, it's it's a lot bigger stage than than just the Dodger game. Yeah. And what's the now? My friend thinks the Dodgers don't do well because of this to the attitude in the city of L.A. is sort of laid back, and 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 especially, I guess the big joke with the Dodger games is is that the people get there late and leave early or something because of the traffic. I don't. I figure you don't. You're a real fan. But is that is that sort of the attitude there, or is, it, is that just the That attitude? is, by and large. If they're behind by a couple of runs in the eighth, people start pouring out of the stadium. Oh, man. And they, they did that on that four-homer night, and they're a bunch of idiots because they they missed it. Yeah, I'll say. That's and you know what? I, I, think, I, I, I think that th- there was a study done about home field advantage. I think the SAB, uh, Society of American Baseball Research – did, a, did this study on, on home field advantage, and there isn't any. Oh, it, really? It, it makes a difference, as I remember, it makes a difference in the postseason by a little bit, but in the regular season, it didn't. the, the, the numbers didn't support it. Huh. That's interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying that's an excuse for L.A. or anything like that, but, <laughs> you know, the people that are there, you know. Apparently don't influence it as much as uh... – Popular no, community. not really. But you know, if things are really heated up, it's supposed to and all that. It's it's you know the place is crowded. You know, there's never less than about probably forty thousand, you know, thirty forty thousand people there. Sometimes you know, like if the Blue Jays come into town, there's twenty thousand. But 
um, you know, when the Cardinals are there, it's sold out. When, when San Francisco's there, it's sold out. Now San Diego, actually, because, you know, I would have never thought a couple of years ago San Diego would be up here and would cause any interest. But at the end of last season, they were both um, – they were practically tied for the uh, – for the – first place and then the wild card and then the, the Dodgers edged him out of the wild card um, by that four homer game they were I think they were behind half a game before that game and then they were they were in first place and then they ended up being wild card going to the going to the uh, playoffs uh, division series and of course losing in four games but you know yeah yeah doing stupid things like having two people cross the plate at the, practically the same time while Paul Leduca <laughs> you know what's <laughs> funny you're you're watching the, we are watching the Mets play the Dodgers in the playoffs and uh, the ball is hit to God who's who's the right fielder for for the Mets last year. I can't remember, but he was a former Dodger. He threw it into Jose Valentin, former Dodger. He related to Paul LaDuca, a former Dodger. And there's two guys crossing the plate at the same time. And LaDuca tags, I think, Kent. And then and then Drew comes through and he's like, who's this guy? He tags him too. Ah. So, you know, it was just this kind of, it was this perfect divine screw up where the former Dodgers you know, kept the present Dodgers out of, out of the playoffs. Yeah. It was a very depressing moment. Now, um, what about the uh, the big steroids in baseball controversy? It sounded like when we were setting this up that you had a, a pretty passionate opinion about it. What uh, you disgusted about the whole scene here now with this? I'm not disgusted about it. I I've, I've got real strong feelings about testing for drugs. I can't stand that. But this is a, this is a little different thing. Um, you know, if somebody's using drugs to get ahead of somebody else who. Who is uh, not using drugs? I don't. I don't think that's fair. Somebody's going to make five million dollars more than another guy that's trying to trying to be um, trying to be on the up and up about it. I don't think it's right. Um, and I, uh, I, I don't know if these people should be shut out of baseball, but I think that they should be shut out of the record books because look at Barry Bonds. It went, before he started taking steroids, he was like a stick figure. Now he now he looks like Gargantua. Yeah. Now, Kimball says it's the fans' fault. Do you agree? <laughs> what do you think of that? Um, I don't think anything the fans do very much affects the commissioner ever. He doesn't care. All he yeah. cares about – well, I guess if the fans spoke with their money, that would affect it. Yeah. I think that – you know, he said because they went home run crazy that the uh, that uh, players and the owners were just giving them what they wanted. And I mean, I guess that's an interesting point of view. I didn't really think of it that way, but – well, yeah, well, that that's true, and I, I I think home runs are completely overrated, and I don't like them. I mean, they're exciting and all that, but it's much more interesting to me when a manager and the players have the wherewithal, the, the, the brains, uh, the guts, and most importantly, the talent to play baseball as a strategic game rather than just hitting home runs. Yeah, well, you know, do do more small ball. You know, get some get some double steals in. You know, uh, uh, do some hit and runs. I don't see that near as often as I'd like to. Grady Little does that, and Jim Tracy would never do that. He was he. I don't know what the hell was wrong with the guy. That'd be a perfect situation for a hit and run, and he wouldn't he wouldn't put one on. It's like, what's wrong with this guy? He doesn't think, or maybe he thought his players couldn't uh, deliver. I don't know, but he would never even try. Grady Little at least tries and he thinks about it, no matter what you think about him and what he what he did with Pedro Martinez in the <laughs> playoffs that year. Well, he's been forgiven since they won the championship after that, so we're kind of we're, we're kind of over that, um, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, yeah. w- w- now, you say you like the small ball better, so you're more of like a National League fan versus the American League, or do you think uh, – what do you think? Are you are you in favor of the no DH type of ruling, or are you like the? Yes, fact I am. Designated really- hitters is one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard of. Wow! Let the pitcher let the pitcher hit. God damn it! It's a it's a it's a baseball game. So <laughs> having a designated hitter to me is like cheating. It's worse than steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and what about uh? He can't hit, so and we don't want him to get hurt. So let's let's not have. I don't even know why that came about. I don't know about the history of it. I'm not sure. I thought it had to do with um. To prevent like bean bean beaning uh, bean ball or some shit like that, where like you know if a guy got beaned, then then they have to retaliate, and you don't want them to bean the pitcher or something like that. But I'm not sure. Well, too to bad. Be a man, Jesus. I wish pe- more people would get beaned. I like when I, I like when people would, there would be that. I do like that too, actually. You no, know, if, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna start plunking people, be prepared for the consequences. If you don't like it, then don't do it. No way. 
<laughs> now, what about uh, – this was uh, really surprising, and I'll throw this one at you because uh, when, when Kimball said it, I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? But I guess uh, I, I, I haven't been a fan as long as you guys have, so uh, it's not, I'm used to it or it came along sort of as I, as I got into baseball. But the interleague play, Kimball's anti-interleague. What, I'm not. Yeah, well, I don't think it's that big a deal. I think it's interesting, exciting, and I like it. I mean, I, I, I've only really been going to baseball games since, like, the mid-'90s. You know what's very funny? I didn't even care about baseball until about 95 when, of all people, you know who John Shirley is, the cyberpunk writer? No, but cyberpunk sounds familiar. Yeah, well, he's the – he's it's a genre. He's, yeah. he's the uh, – he's best known for being the screenwriter on The Crow, the okay. movie with, yeah, Brandon Lee. And uh, lots of uh, cyberpunk novels. Um, uh, Mac Tony's is a big fan of his. I, he, I went to. He was moving out of L.A. and I went over to his house and he had all these books in the front yard. And he said, "Take what you want." I'm like, you know, I'm just going to throw them away. And I was like, there was this that uh, Ken Burns documentary on baseball that was on public TV. Mm-hmm. He had the book from that. Oh wow! That, this big fat book. And he, I said, "What are you doing with this?" He goes, ah, "Somebody gave it to me. I don't want it." So I took it and I, I read it. And I ended up reading it like three times in a row, the entire book. Wow. And I was suddenly very interested. I don't know why. And I started playing. No, I think it was like 93. Because then I started playing softball, which I've been doing ever since then. And uh, I've, been in, I've been in softball leagues for, what, like 13 years now. And uh, it was a really weird way to get interested in it. And that the main reason I'm a Dodger fan is because I live here. You know, yeah. if I lived in Boston, I'd be a Boston fan. If I, I'd still follow the Dodgers and be interested. But, you know, if I lived in Boston or – well, New York is about the only place I wouldn't be a fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't live in New York. There's no way I would live there. Now, what about uh, – do you have a pick for this year before I ask you uh, one other thing about the uh, the Dodgers here? Do you have a pick for, for who you think is going to win the World Series? Uh, you know, the Yankees are overdue. I hate to say it. But they're overdue. And, they're, you know what, uh, Steinbrenner is probably going to fire everybody if they don't win. <laughs> <laughs> he wants one every year or two, so you know. But uh uh past that, like like I told you before, I don't really follow other teams too much. Mm-hmm. I, I follow them when they're in town so I can see, you know, and see how the Dodgers are going to do against them. Yeah. Um so yeah, New York of course and uh Cardinals of course and um a lot of people seem to think the Dodgers have a lot better shot this year than they did last year. I'm inclined to believe, and because I don't have my season tickets anymore, it's a perfect time for them to do it. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, it would make sense because I'm going to have a real hard time getting my tickets to the postseason. When la- last year, all I had to do was say, I'll take these, 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 and these, and uh, you know, pay for them up front. I still have... I still have, from last year and two years before when they're in the playoffs, I've I've got World Series tickets for World Series that never happened. <laughs> oh man! And they're they're huge too. They're these huge tickets are like five times the size of a normal baseball. <laughs> it's like Game Three World Series Dodgers versus whoever. <laughs> oh man! And um. And when we had Go Rightly on, see, I know you and Adam uh, are friends and stuff and probably talk, uh, probably bust each other's chops a lot. He said he was uh, talking about the, uh, giving you some hell about the MK Ultra Dodgers story and, and how uh, wearing a Dodgers cap endorses MK Ultra or something. Can you shed light on this Dodgers MK Ultra connection that, that I'd never heard well, of? The first thing I'll shed light on is Adam looks for any way to get at me and, and get my goat about the Dodgers. I don't know why he wants to fight with me about the Dodgers <laughs> and the Giants. It seems, you know, to me, it's like, you know, because people will get into like fist fights in the stands during Dodgers Giants game. It's like, what the hell? It's just a baseball game, you guys. What, why are you, what are you so serious about? Yeah. And so I don't like to fight with him on it. If he, get, if I can get a good dig in once in a while, if he starts it, I will. But um, the, the the one way to get at me on that was he pointed out that uh, in Kathy O'Brien's book, uh, Transformation of America, T R A N C E, Formation of America. Um, she, uh, if you don't know about the book, she claims to have been a CIA sex slave for like I don't know twenty years or something, mm-hmm. and she was like. Uh, and she names all these people that she was a sex slave for, and uh, one of them was Ronald Reagan, and God, another one was uh, Bill Clinton, and and uh, it, you know just about any, everybody who was anybody. If you read the, I, I bought the book in Roswell in '97 at the at the 50th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and we went back to the room, and I sat there with a couple friends. We just read passages out of the book and rolled on the floor laughing. <laughs> 
Um, so this is where the information is coming from, folks. Okay. Um, but she does claim in the book that uh, uh, Tommy Lasorda, when they when they won the series in 1981, um, was using CIA mind control techniques and CIA mind controlled baseball players to win. Uh, based on the MK Ultra um, uh, protocols or, or discoveries or whatever, so Adam likes to point that out to me to say that they didn't legitimately win the series. It's like, oh, so Kurt Gibson was an MK Ultra, <laughs> you know, trainee or something. It's like, you know, dude, you're grasping at straws here. I think it's funny. I don't think there's any truth to it, but I sure think it's damned funny. Yeah. And I said, well, what about 1988 when, uh, you know, and he doesn't have an answer for that. There you go. And so, like I said, we had you on the show way long ago now at this point, a uh, really long time ago, over over a year and a half at this point. Ages. I know, I know. And luckily... In the we'll... Triassic, I think I was uh, a guest. <laughs> well, yeah, well, after you were on the show, then Rick Doty had this big renaissance with Serpo and everything. It was crazy. But uh, so what have you been up to since since you've been on Banal of America? And uh, obviously you got this big UFO mystic blog going and stuff. And uh, what, what, what have your adventures been since since the last appearance on the show? Well, I've, I finished – had I finished? Yeah, I'd finished Weird California by then. Um, recently they, they, they uh, recruited me to do a series of um, shoots for, for commercials for budget rent-a-car – where you know, I know you're sitting there look, looking at your phone, going, "Huh, what?" Yeah. Um, I guess they're they're gonna. I'm I'm a I'm a corporate whore at the pig trough right now. <laughs> well, I, I you know they're not using my face or anything because you know who the hell knows who I am. But um, they're paying me to go out to places that I wrote about, like the racetrack playa in Death Valley and the Hollywood uh, Cemetery here, and a couple haunted houses and things like that with a, with a video camera, which they sent me. And I guess I just shoot segments for them, you know, at these various places, and they use it to advertise car rentals. You know, go on a weird vacation. Weird. So that's something I'm just about to start doing. Awesome. Um, maybe it'll turn into something where I don't have to, you know, have a regular job a couple days a week, which would be nice. Um, I was uh, – it's on a hold, but I'm, I'm – uh, supposed to write a book with another researcher, but I'm not going to say who that is right now until it turns into an actual deal. Yeah, um, has to do with um, uh, whistleblowers in the government, which I'm slightly ambivalent about. But the, that's the main reason I wanted to work on it. It's like, okay, convince me that there's something here and there's some truth to it. Let me let me look into it, be forced to look into it, and see, you know, if anybody like. Uh, God, I'm trying to think of you know, Bob Lazar or or uh, Doty for that matter. Is there there anything to these people's stories that we should listen to that is legitimate and deserves some uh, deserves attention and credibility that gets closer to some answer about at least what the government knows? Which I've already made my decision about that. I don't think they really know very much at all. Yeah. Um, I think they they know a lot more than than we do about the mechanics of things, not the mechanics, but the facts. Yeah, they have no idea about why, from where, and what for. Yeah, the big just questions. as much in the dark as you and I and anybody else is interested in UFOs is. Now, uh, when I also saw, well, first of all, how did UFO Mystic come about? Just a collaboration between you and Nick? No, somebody approached us. This guy, the the, the same people own and and operate the uh, Crypto Mundo site. Oh, okay. That Lauren Coleman is the main writer on, and uh, said uh, we'd like to do a UFO uh, blog. Eventually, maybe to you know to get advertising, make a little bit of money, which I'm not going to hold my breath. But um, they they got Nick on board, and they said, do you know of anybody else who might be good for this? And he, luckily for me, he said, yeah, Greg. So we met with him. We went back and forth with a contract for about a year. Uh, through about four different iterations till it got to the point that where Nick and I liked it. We signed the contract and uh, we started we started blogging. And uh, the main reason I did it is, is, is to keep my writing going. And I notice now when I write something, I don't even have to think about it. It's just like, bam, it comes out. And I, I look at it and I say, maybe I need to edit. And then I'll look and go, well, no, I don't. That's, that's pretty much okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, even back in December – when I hadn't written anything for about eight months, at, at least, you know, constantly, um, make, makes me feel a lot better about, 
in uh, picking up a story or finding something I want to write about, an opinion, and being able to do whatever I want and then have people react to it because I really like that part. Yeah. I love having people answer me, point out something that's wrong, um, agree with me, whatever, because um, if, if you just want to make pronouncements and have everybody agree with you, then, then there's – why bother? Exactly. Um, I want people to – interact, point things out, discuss things with me and debate because sometimes they'll change my mind and other times I'll change their mind and other times we just agree to disagree, which is also nice too. And the other thing about UFO Mystic is it keeps me on top of the subject matter because I have to. Yeah. Unless there, you know, unless I've got something pushing me or pulling me or whatever you want to call it, unless there's somebody expecting something, I have a really hard time getting off my butt and doing anything. <laughs> I know oh. what you mean, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, because, you know, what you have is like, oh, people are expecting a show next week. I better get off my butt and do it. Exactly, yeah. Somebody is expecting a blog in the next day or two. I better get off my butt and think of something to write. <laughs> it's like having a column. And I, I really like that. And I've, I've gotten book ideas out of it. I've met new people. And, you know, to me, that's that's uh, more than enough uh, uh, reason um, to uh, be doing this blog, and I, I've I've really enjoyed it, and I've I've learned a lot of stuff just by doing the blog. And uh, the last thing I want to ask you about was that you uh, on UFO Mystic, you had mentioned that you were maybe getting your hands on a copy of the Bill Moore uh, infamous Bill Moore speech from the MUFON convention. Any update on that? Uh, no, I'm still waiting for the person to get back to me. The one guy that said he had it says that he doesn't know where it is now. So somebody oh. else at Laughlin told me they had it. So I just have to keep. Um, nudging them until it gets sent along to me. It's actually a videotape of him. Nice. So, But the thing is, I said, well, is it a videotape of him or all the people up? Because he was speaking at a podium, but there were people sitting up at the front with him, like Hal Starr, who was running. I think he was the head of uh, Nevada MUFON at the time, mm -hmm. some other people. And uh, But, it, you know, I hope that the microphone was decent enough, you know, omnidirectional enough that you can actually hear what people were yelling in the audience because there were some choice things yelled at Bill Moore that night. And uh, I, I, I want to see if I can remember it right. I, I do, I've do. i got the original copy of the, the sheet that he read off of done on a dot matrix printer that he, that he used in Vegas nice. with all of his cross-outs and notes and everything on it. Oh, cool. So I, wanna, I also want to compare it with the trans, that, that little, the, the, not little, it's like, 40 pages long, and uh, see where he went off the script if he did, and um, just just to have that would be interesting, and then, you know, see if I can get permission maybe to, to uh, uh, post it, or if MUFON wants to sell it, I don't know. I don't know who owns the tape. I guess it was for MUFON, so that, I guess they would own it. Yeah, I would love to see it. Uh, that's something like, uh, that's like, a, I think a lot of hardcore UFO fans would, would want to see that. People who know of the story, definitely, who never heard, never saw it. Yeah, because at the very least, you'll see him stop and look and look at the audience for a while until everybody calms down. Oh yeah, it would just be amazing. I think just, just a couple of times, the Hal Star had to get up there and say, you know, he's here and now he's our guest, and you have to let him say what he wants. So quiet down, class. Oh wow, that's like uh, Dylan goes electric almost. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> exactly. There's, there's, I don't know. There's 500 people at least, maybe 800 or more sitting in that room. I remember it was packed. It was standing room only. And I, I was sitting about halfway up the the row, uh, up the uh, up the uh, row of chairs there in the hall, and I had just started getting back interested in ufology again, and I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was like, "What the hell are these people all so mad about?" Yeah. And that I think that was like one of these defining moments that made me want to get back into the subject and and, and find out what was going on because I knew I had known Bill like maybe six months before that. I had met up with him, talked to him, we started, you know just hanging out and having lunch and talking about stuff. And then he said, I'm going to blow their socks off with this. Well, what is it, Bill? I don't want to tell you. And then I just kind of sat there and ran, <clears throat> ran his table, his like merchandise table for, for the weekend just to help him out. Then he gave this speech and I sat out there and watched people come out and they were yelling at me. Huh. Where did you get this crowd from? I was like, I don't know. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, man. Because he ran out the back door and he said, you know, you and uh, there was a, another guy helping him. Could you please sit at the table after it's done and sell copies of the speech? Weird. And uh, that, that that was quite exciting. I had no idea what was going on and why people were so mad, but I sure wanted to find out. And that's why I'm sitting here talking to you today. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, well, thanks. Uh, obviously, we're we're going to be talking more on Sunday on, on uh, Radio Mysterioso. 
Yes, it's uh, Sunday from 8 to 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time on killradio.org. Awesome, awesome. Yes, we'll be, we'll, be, uh, we'll be discussing all sorts of UFO-related matters. And, of course, you can find out more information on Greg Bishop at ufomystic.com. And do you still use the, the excluded middle, right? Yeah, people can go there. It's, it's basically a, uh, a sealed and amber version of the magazine with, with occasional updates about what I'm doing and uh, points of interest that have to do with uh, people who are into the magazine, yeah. Awesome. So they can also check out uh, excludedmiddle.com, E-X-C-L-U-D-E-D-M-I-D-D-L-E.com, and ufomystic.com, U-F-O-M-Y-S-T-I-C.com. Those are the websites. I'm looking forward to talking to you again on Sunday. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Greg. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. I hope we can be on again soon. Definitely, definitely. It was great talking to you again. Have it, folks. That does it for the Been All of America Audio Baseball Special. Big, big thanks to Adam Go Rightly, Paul Kimball, and Greg Bishop for taking some time out of the past week to come on the program. And of course, retroactive thanks to Stan Friedman and Lauren Coleman for coming on the program back in the day. Hope you enjoyed the Been All of America Audio Baseball Special. Moving right along now, we're going to skip over Been All of America Audio listener feedback. The reason is simple. It's late already in the process. Uh, it's Sunday afternoon. The episode should have been up last night. We're all set back by a computer malfunction at the Been All of America Audio headquarters. Our main desktop computer completely shit the bed on us uh, last Sunday. And as a result, the whole operation is running off of a laptop computer right now with all new editing software, and it's uh, quite a finagled mess. And I was definitely in over my head a tad here with the five guests and the new software and trying to run it all on the laptop instead of on the desktop. So the episode was pushed back quite a bit, and we want to get it out to you as fast as possible. So we'll skip over Banal of America audio listener feedback for this week. If you have thoughts on this episode or a previous episode or the show in general, a comment, a guest suggestion, a critique, whatever, I can handle it. There's two ways to go about doing it. Go to banalofamerica.com, click the contact button in the top right-hand corner of the screen, or simply write to boaaudio at hotmail.com, boaaudio at hotmail.com. Either one of those methods puts your correspondence on the road to being featured on Manal of America Audio listener feedback. Up next, it's time for the thanks. Big, big thanks to the manalofamerica.com staff for your help and support with the audio series and the website. It's weeks like this that I really and truly appreciate them tremendously. The computer goes down, everything's haywire at the headquarters, but I'm still getting top-notch reading material from the BOA writers to put up on the site for the great readers of banalofamerica.com. If you missed out on what they had for you this past week, let me give you a rundown of what it was. R. Lee's Trickster's Realm dealt with the McMinnville Trent Farm UFO case. She's done a lot of great research on this and had an amazing article dealing with that and the trickster element to the whole thing. Leslie's Gray Matters responded to the Fife Symington Phoenix Lights story that made big news in ufology last week. She has a passionate response to Fife's revelation of his UFO sighting that has to be read to be believed, and it really echoes some of my opinions on the big story from the past week. And after that, on Wednesday, Chiron had the K-Files movie loft, where he reviewed Loose Change, the second edition. Great review of the film, for those of you who haven't seen it, it gives you a nice overview of what it's all about and what Chiron liked and disliked about the film. The K-Files movie loft continues to break around here in esoteric movie reviews, so big ups to Chiron for this great review of Loose Change, a film I haven't seen yet, but now I'm thinking about checking it out, thanks to the K-Files movie loft. Those are some of the columns that were up at banalofamerica.com this past week. As I've been saying, week in and week out here on the program, if you're only listening to Banal of America Audio, you're only getting half the story. you got to read the columns at BOA. Banalofamerica.com, make it a part of your everyday search for esoteric news and opinion. Throwing a little plug in, it may be too late by the time you hear this, but I should say it. Tonight I'll be on Greg Bishop's Radio Mysterioso, as you may have heard from our interview just now. I will be on there from 8 to 10 p.m. Pacific Time, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Phone calls will be taken in the second hour. 
So if you've downloaded this in the evening tonight and you're listening to it on Sunday night and you want to call in or check out the interview, you can simply go to killradio.org, killradio.org, at 8 p.m. Pacific Time or 11 p.m. Eastern Time and get your fix of Double Been All Weekend on Greg Bishop's Radio Misterioso. When I get the word from Greg on the MP3s of the episode, I will keep you posted and we'll have a link up for those at binallofamerica.com once Radio Mysterioso has the MP3s up and running post-interview. So either way, if you're not around tonight or if you're listening to this on April 2nd and you missed the interview, you'll be able to hear it sometime in the not-too-distant future. If you're a long-time Banal of America audio listener, an appreciative newcomer, and you want to help support the audio series and the website, there's a way to do it. You go to banalofamerica.com, you click the PayPal button, and you make a donation. BOA is a grassroots operation, and sometimes a grassroots operation needs some water, and that's where you come in. Click the PayPal button, make a donation, help this movement grow. Next week on the program, there's not going to be a program. There's not going to be a program for the next two weeks. It's the Banal of America Audio Spring Break. I'll be honest with you folks, with the computer crashing and this changeover in software and just the general style in which we do the program, pre-tapes, we need a little break here. We're getting a little burned out, and we figured it's perfect timing. Spring has begun. Take the first two weeks of April off. Collect the final batch of interviews as we head towards the season finale of Been All of America Audio Season 2. I can't believe it. I can't believe it's almost the season finale, but it is. It's coming up. We are already hard at work parsing a very select list of potential people to be the Ben All of America Audio season finale. That will be in June. Of course, there's tons and tons more episodes coming up before then. They will start up April 21st, 2007. Ben All of America Audio kicks off the final leg of season two. There's only a handful of places left in the calendar here for Banal of America Audio Season 2. Who will fill out those final places? It's a mystery for now. We know who some of the people are. We've already recorded the interviews. Stay tuned to BanalofAmerica.com over the next two weeks as we will tease out who some of the final guests will be here on BOA Audio Season 2. And on that note, we call it a week. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the baseball special You'll be hearing from me again on April 21st, 2007, when BOA Audio returns. Until then, enjoy the spring break, my friends. Until then, this is Tim Benall, signing off.